Press Room Live. It's Jack Raymond, online pastor. I'm so excited to have you join us from all over the world. We have an online team who wants to connect with you right now. We can pray for you, serve you. Let us know where you're joining us from. We'd love to have you share this with a friend. This is going to be an exciting Sunday at Prestonwood. We're about to kick off our services with our awesome first graders. They're getting presented God's word because we at Prestonwood believe in investing in the next generation. Our student choir is leading in worship. It is going to be a powerful Sunday. And then we have guest speaker Jay Strack bringing the message about how we all can be involved in investing in the next generation. Well, I hope right now you're texting a friend, letting them know to worship Jesus. And we hope that you'll prepare your mind, prepare your hearts to worship Jesus together right now. Well, good morning, Prestonwood family. Is this not a beautiful sight on the platform this morning? Here in our 930 service and then again at 11 o'clock this morning, we're going to have over 100 Prestonwood first graders. And this is something that we do every year is we provide them with a copy of God's Word, a Bible. Now, whether they had one before or not, maybe their families gave them one or uh, they've had one in different ways, but this is a special time in our services where first graders, boys and girls, we want to share with you a copy of God's Word. We want to give you a Bible. They've got it all in their hands. Now, boys and girls, first graders, I want you to look at me now. I want you to take that Bible that our church has given you. I want you to hold it up real high. Hold it up real high. Yes. And boys and girls, here's what we want to tell you. This morning, as we get ready to worship together, you can put it down, look at me now. Boys and girls, as we get ready to worship together, here's what we want you to remember about God's Bible. That Bible in your hands today is a special, special gift because it tells you all about God's love and who He is and what He wants you to do. Now, church family, as you know, we have a verse that we like to share from time to time here in our pulpit, in our Bible teaching, in our life groups. Boys and girls, you've probably heard this verse before. It's Psalm 119, 11. The scripture says that I've hidden, I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, first graders, look right at me. I want you to remember something. That when God's word says for you to store it up, to hide it, to put it in your heart, here's what it means. It means that he wants you to read it. He wants you to read that Bible that you're holding. And when you read it, he wants you to put it inside your heart in such a way where you think about it. The big grown-up word is meditate. That word really means just to put it inside your heart, to read it, to let God's word fill your mind and fill your thoughts and fill your heart. And here's why. Because first graders, God wants you to share his word with everyone that you meet. And so boys and girls, we want you to know this morning as a church family that we love you, that we're proud of you. And as you take that Bible this morning, you come to big church with mom and dad and your family and come hear the preaching of God's word. Go to your life group and let someone teach you God's Bible. And as you learn it and as you grow up to follow Jesus, you'll be ready to share God's word with the people around you. Now, church family, as these boys and girls hold up that Bible high, and as they're saying to you this morning that they're going to hide that word in their heart. They're going to store it up in such a way that not only will they not sin against the Lord, but that they'll live for Jesus all of their lives. Church family, we want to encourage you. We want to challenge you this morning that we do all we can as a body of believers to encourage these kids, to equip these kids, and to empower these kids to go out and live for Jesus and all they do. Church family, if you are ready to make that commitment in a fresh and a new way to see these boys and girls and the next generation go out and live for Jesus, will you just say amen today? Amen. Now, boys and girls, everybody that just said amen, what they're telling you is, is that they love you and they're proud of you and that they can't wait to see who God's making you to be and how you're going to live for Jesus in all you do in everywhere you go in everything that you say and how you share. And so, church family, we're reminded this morning of the power of God in every generation. 
And as we have our student choir in just a moment with our adult choir leading us in worship, we have these boys and girls here on the platform with us receiving their Bible as first graders, coming into worship together as families and as followers and as brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. We are reminded of the power of the gospel for every generation, in every generation, not only now, but in the days ahead. And so we're committing as a church family, like never before, to pour in and to invest. I want to challenge you. I want you to prayerfully be thinking. If you don't yet have a place of service in our church, if you don't have a lane of ministry that you've stepped into, I can't think of a better ministry for you to potentially pray about and give your life to than to come alongside and love on precious kids like this. Come alongside our next-gen ministries and our elementary, or our preschool, or our preteen, or our student ministries, and come and pour your life and live out what you've been storing up out of this Bible in your hearts. Many of you, you've been reading God's Word for a long time. And just like we want these precious first graders to be doing, and you've got a lot stored up in you, will you pray about how you could serve and be a part of our church pouring in to the next generation? Hey, if you're proud of and excited for these first graders, will you just tell them how much you love them this morning? Give them a big hand. First grader boys and girls, we're praying for you. We are proud of you. We're praying for your families, your moms, your dads, your grandparents, your brothers and sisters. Boys and girls, you take that Bible, you read it, you think about it, and you share it with everybody that you meet. Well, let's pray for these amazing kids, and then we'll worship together. Lord, we love you today. And as we come now, Father, into a time of worship and praise to lift high your name, to elevate your name, Jesus, above all other names, God, it warms our heart and it encourages us to see these amazing boys and girls holding your word high, not only now in this room, but in their hearts. And we pray, God, for years and years of faithfulness to come as they live for you, as they learn your word, and as they live out loud the story of the gospel to everyone they meet. So now, Jesus, we invite your presence into this place. Be lifted up, be glorified, and be worshiped, Father, in all we do, all we say, God, be praised this morning. And we pray it in your powerful name. Amen. Moms and dads and families of these first graders, if you'll wave or stand, we love them, but they're probably not going to hang out on here the whole time, okay? So if you'll stand up, raise your hands and wave. Boys and girls, you're dismissed to go see your families this morning. God bless you. Yeah, come on, give them a hand. That takes a lot of courage to get out here. All right, church family, I hope you brought some energy because I know back behind me, there's a lot of energy today. We got our students in the house ready to lead us in worship. Are you ready? Come on, stand to your feet. We've got our new student worship associate, Ethan Severin, who's going to lead us today. Are you ready? Come on, put your hands together. Let's sing. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could care? That kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide it was my tomb Till I met you Whoa. You called my name
Morning, Preston Wood. We have uh, four that are coming following Christ in believers' baptism. Uh, this this is Naomi Mizuko. Uh, this is Linda, our interpreter. Naomi is uh, new to our hearing impaired ministry, and uh, she is from Japan. And told me she's the only one in her family that's that's a following Christ. So Naomi, are you following Christ in baptism because you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior? Because of that, oh wait. Yes, I do. Because of that public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, I baptize you now, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That means hallelujah. <laughs> this is Micah Nagera. Micah Nagara. Micah, you following Christ in baptism because you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. Yes. Because of that public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, I baptize you now, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then we have a father and a daughter. This is Robert Wilson. Robert, are you following Christ in baptism because you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Because of that public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this is Madeline Wilson. Madeline, are you following Christ in baptism because you've accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Because of that public profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and obedience to his command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in the likeness of his death, raised to walk in the newness of life. Let's continue to rejoice, church. Change lives is always worth celebrating. Would you give me grab a seat? Hey, I want to also piggyback uh, on Pastor Jonathan Teague's welcome to you earlier. Uh, and extend a, a warm, wo warm welcome to all of our guests in the house today. And for those of you who are joining us online, we are thrilled to have you here worshiping with us at Prestonwood. And if you would, as you're taking a moment to get to know us, we would love the opportunity to get to know you. If you would, if you would go ahead and text the word CONNECT to the number 74788 and allow us to get some information from you. We'd love to follow up and, and get to know you. If for whatever reason your cell phone isn't working or you choose not to, we would still love to connect with you after the service immediately out here in our atrium. Come and swing by, come visit with us. It would be a blessing for that to happen. Now, later on in our service, we have a near and dear friend to Prestonwood and to, to Pastor Graham. Dr. Jay Strack is in the house. Can we give a warm welcome to Dr. Jay Strack? He's no stranger to Preston Wood, and we're excited to have him in the pulpit. He's going to bring a powerful message from God's Word. And Pastor's going to talk a little bit more about Dr. Strack later. 
But as the next gen pastor here at Prestonwood, I cannot be more thrilled and grateful to have a man such as Jay here bringing God's word. A man who has, over the past several decades, invested into the lives of thousands and thousands of young teenagers and adults that has a tremendous impact, not just on this side of eternity, but for all of eternity. So Dr. J. Shrek, thank you for your investment to the kingdom of God and what you do. It truly does matter in this next generation. So thank you. Can we just show a, a little bit of appreciation one more time for this amazing student choir today as well? <laughs> Prestonwood is a church that does believe in the next generation. And if that's not evident today by allowing students to help lead us to the throne in worship, I don't know what else is. Church family, I got some exciting news for you as well. Yesterday, we had an opportunity to equip and empower and multiply and launch out our life groups where hundreds of students and leaders went out to North Dallas to go and share and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I just got to tell you, it's because of your generous and faithful giving that we're able to do this, that we can raise up a generation that loves and pursues and follows after the Lord and then makes him known to the generations and to the ends of the world. So thank you for your faithful giving. Thank you for your stewardship and how you sow seeds and how you invest with your treasures, with your time, and with your talents. Church family, this is an amazing day to worship. We're going to lift up our voices and sing to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we're going to give thanks to the Lord for all he has done and all he will do. Would you pray with me in this moment as we continue to worship? So, Father, it's in this moment. Father, we declare your holiness in this place. Father, you are, you are majestic above all. And, Jesus, we ask, Lord, that our faces would turn to you, our hearts and our eyes would be fixed on you. Jesus, we give you thanks for all you have done and all you will continue to do. Father, in this service, draw people into yourself. We praise you and we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Would you stand with us as we worship, we sing from the darkness. From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love. You bore my weakness, you took my shame. You buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out and lifted me up. How great is your love from the heights, from the heights of heaven, you step down to earth, innocent perfection, you gave your life for us and we are amazed, and we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the i 
Praise the name of the Lord. <laughs> you may be seated. It's my privilege to introduce my good friend Jay Strack, who will be preaching this morning. Jay and I have known each other for many years, in fact, over 40 years, and he and Diane are among our closest friends in life. Deb and I love them very much and their family. And Jay is many things. He is an evangelist. He is a Bible teacher. He is a leader of students in that student leadership university, has trained tens of thousands of students in worldview and leadership, making a difference in the world. Jay is an author of books. He is a leader in our nation. He's one of the great spokesmen for Christ in our nation today. And so it's been a while since Jay has been with us, and I invited him to be here today. And though I can't be there with you today uh, in that I'm out of town, I wanted you to know how thankful I am that Jay is with us today and praying with you as he delivers God's word and gives the invitation to respond to the gospel of Christ. So let's all welcome Jay Strack, who's preaching God's word at Prestonwood today. Well, thank you. I'm a little in shock, so forgive me. The pastor was gracious. That's new for him. Uh, I can tell you one reason why he was so nice and sweet, is he's worried about what I would say. That's the only reason. But I'm not going to let that stop. No, but anyway, uh, I'm not going to spend all my time telling you how honored I am to be back. This was our home for many years, Diane and I. And uh, uh, both our daughters uh, were, uh, really took their first steps and their first steps towards the Lord as well as first steps in life. So we love this church and your pastor and the team is a remarkable, remarkable team. And Prestonwood, you got something very special here. I know you know that. We, uh, during COVID, we were with you almost every week. My wife will be watching, Diane, uh, who loves this church and uh, many aspects of the women's ministry back in the day. Uh, really, we, we got our first start. And, and so anyway, with much gratitude, I'm pumped to be here. Now, after hearing the youth choir, I got to confess, I almost spiked my Bible. But I thought, no, <laughs> you know. And it's, but now, if Dallas was what we, anyway, I would have probably spiked it. But today, I'm trying, I'm just prayerful. But uh, thank you, Youth Choir, seeing young men and young women not ashamed of the gospel is very encouraging. So if you have your Bible, I know some of us have ours memorized, but if, if you have your Bible, turn with me, please, uh, to Matthew chapter 24. So whether you have parchment and, paint and uh, leather, or whether you have it on a screen, the Word of God is what? The Word of God, right? So we're grateful for any way and means that we can read God's Word and communicate God's Word. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, we're going to unpack for a few minutes, I believe, the most accurate commentary for what's going on on our planet. My message is entitled, Being Present at the Future. Now, I don't know if it's because I heard constantly teachers reminding me, Jay, you need to actually be here uh, in school. My background, six broken homes, six foster homes, a bunch of detention centers. Uh, I missed a lot of school. I grew up on commercial fishing boats. Uh, Five of my six uh, dads were uh, commercial fishermen, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. But I want you to know I was not, I would miss months and months of school, and then detention centers sometimes, I, I, I had good reasons, I want to say to all the teachers, uh, I was uh, lost and dazed and confused. A young junkie, I was 17, hair to my waist, and track marks up and down my arms when I heard the gospel for the first time, and Jesus changed my life. And I, I have one gift that I'm very good at. I have a big mouth, all right? So I've been privileged to use my big mouth to try to brag on Jesus. 
So I don't know if it's because of my background that it was stressed to me, you have to be present in class, but I, I love that phrase, present at the future. Not just be alive, obviously, at the future. And by the way, the definition of the future keeps changing. By the way, the future keeps changing. And by the way, there's not a single thing you can do to prepare the future for you. We saw those beautiful children on stage with their Bible. We saw these young people. Man, uh, man, I'd take them into battle. I mean, I, I love the way they sang and what they sang. But I want you to know that uh, we cannot prepare the future for our children or our teenagers. We can't prepare the future, but we can, by the grace of God, prepare them. And I say to all the young men and all the young ladies in this room, that if you're going to be serious about life, you got to be serious about yourself. And the Bible tells us over and over again, there's an event coming and no one knows the hour or the day. And we hear all kinds of stuff on the radio and on the television and online and uh, social media. Everybody's got a comment and opinion. But I want to remind you, Jesus said, no one knows that day or hour. The angels don't know, only my Father in heaven knows. So there is a day coming when you and I must be ready. So I can't prepare my children, my grandchildren. I can't prepare all the uh, students that come through student leadership. I can't prepare the future for them. But hear me, make a note. We can prepare them for the future. So I'm going to ask you to write down a phrase. Pen, pencil, lipstick, mascara, whatever you got. I'm going to ask you to write down a phrase. And the phrase is this, the future belongs to those who are prepared. The future belongs to those who are prepared. And please know and please understand, the word prepare means three things in the original. It means, number one, to be pointed in the right direction. So obviously, if you've got your children, your grandchildren uh, in church, and in a school where they're learning the Word of God, I want you to know your help pointing them in the right direction. We must be pointed in the right direction if we're going to be prepared. But number two, and this is the heart of everything, we've got to be made complete. And that only happens, it happened to me when I was 17 and I knew hardly anything about the things of God. I just knew the great emptiness in my life. I was overwhelmed by the story of his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and I couldn't blow off the young people I saw whose lives had been changed. That was the acid test for me. It wasn't just a great story that moved my heart, that God loved me and had a plan for my life. You know, there's a verse that says he knows the number of hairs uh, on your head. Did you know that? And your wig too, by the way. I don't want to leave anybody out. And some of us are in these days and years are making life a little easier on the Lord. We don't have as much hair to count. I had hair everywhere back in the day. And I'm going, he must love me if he knows the number of hairs on my head. But I saw young people, and that was the final evidence for me. And I made that decision that night to stand. And I asked him to come live in my heart. And I, I just prayed, Lord... I don't know why you want me, but if you want me, I want you. Please come into my heart. And that night changed my life. So number one, you got to be pointed in the right direction to be prepared. Number two, you got to be made complete, which I believe only truly, genuinely happens when one's had that life-saving, life-changing experience, that personal encounter with the personal God. But number three, and this is where the church comes in, this is where Christian education comes in, but you must be prepared for battle. And we're going to begin, Matthew chapter 24, we're going to see why we must be prepared for battle. Now, one other word about the title, because it's a little unusual. It's not original with me. There's a book out by a guy that was called... Uh, uh, 
the nation's most famous scientist. And you know why he had that claim? He was on National Public Radio, had a program called Science on Friday, or Friday Science, and he interviewed all the great scientists of the world. And he wrote this book, Present at the Future. And I just want you to know some of the things that the book covered. And this is the world we live in. Quantum physics, nanotechnology, string theory, space travel, water on Mars, alternative energy, stem cell research. And here's my favorite. We want to use the universe and make it the super, their term, science's terms, the super, super computer of the future, they say, will be the universe. But here's the one thing we know. We still can't figure out with all of our science why the shower curtain, and this happened to me again at the hotel, why does the shower curtain stick to you? I, I don't understand that. We can solve all these mysteries and we can make all these discoveries. I just need to buy a vow on that thing about the shower curtain, sorry. The Hubble telescope, we've all heard of that, has revealed that the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So if you want to celebrate the universe's birthday, good luck with that. Now, they even discovered the two new moon, two moons of Pluto. Well, I don't know about you, but man, that'll, that'll change my life. Uh, Pluto's got two moons. We're not close enough for me to share with you their names. It's kind of private. But I just want you to understand that the more we learn, what? The more we don't know. And the more we learn, the more questions we have. And knowledge is a moving target. So somewhere on this little planet, and by the way, this little planet out of, I mean, it's infathomable how many uh, stars and planets, I mean, we don't even know what all still is going on. But here's what we know. We're a privileged planet. One degree closer to the sun, we're a Pop-Tart. One degree further away from the sun, we're a popsicle. We're called the privileged planet. NASA calls Earth the blue marble because it's the only one. Now, there are some stars that are burning gases, and those burning gases make different colors, but we're the only planet thus far that's not gray and lifeless and just there. Somehow, some way, we're located in the one spot in the universe, at least according to what we've all discovered thus far, that life could happen. Now, did it happen by accident? Or was there a creator? Is there a designer? Is there a loving, personal God who created this planet and created man and created woman. I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to get in trouble. But I want you to know I'm just going by what the Creator said, and I'm going with Him, okay? I even trust what the Creator said more than the Hubble te telescope, all right? So I'm a little biased there. Now, here's what we must understand. This God did not leave us down here to try to figure out with every new theory and every new whim of culture, God gave us a word, and it's the Word of God. Amen. And the Bible tells us heaven and earth will pass away, but the words in this book will remain forever. And that's a promise from God Himself. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Matthew 24, let's look at kind of the newspaper headlines. You ready? And even though Matthew chapter 24 is a prophecy, right? Even though Matthew 24 is uh, when Jesus gave those words looking forward 2,000 years, but you and I can honestly say this sounds like the evening news. Look at Matthew 24, beginning at verse 1. It says, and after, you know, Jesus showed them these things and he made his way through the valley of Kinron, uh, he sat down, and the, the disciples 
and his followers were still enamored by everything they'd seen in Herod's temple. And by the way, there's an ancient writer that says, if one was not alive to see with his own eyes the beauty of Herod's temple, then you are not able to ever describe beauty. And that was one author, one historian, but it was about the beauty of Herod's temple. The massiveness of it. Every stone weighed 2,000 pounds. And the majesty of it, the beauty of it. Herod wasn't the born king. You know the Christmas story. He had been appointed by the Romans. He was not qualified to be the king. He wasn't even chosen by the people to be the king. Rome put him there. So he was trying to endear himself to these religious and devout Jews. So he rebuilt uh, the temple, you know, Solomon's temple. And then there was the Rubbables rebuilding on that. And then Herod's temple trying to earn their favor. And the disciples were just ooing and aahing. These were country boys from Galilee, fishermen. They just couldn't get over what all they'd seen and all the people. And can I tell you what I think was a knife in the heart of those early disciples when they came to Jesus and started asking him these questions about the temple? You know what brought it about? There was Herod's temple. All its beauty, all its majesty, all the hustle and bustle. And yet they knew that Jesus, as he said with his own mouth, did not have a a nest or a den to rest in like the birds of the air or the foxes. Jesus was homeless. Jesus stayed with folks as they invited him. And so you know in the back of their minds, they're hearing Jesus talk about death. They're hearing Jesus talk about the crucifixion. They're hearing Jesus talk about that he'll be taken away. And they're looking at all the beauty and they see this temple that had been there and would, in their minds, be there forever. And they're trying to get their head around, I'm going to give my life to this one who says he's here for just a little while and his life will be laid down voluntarily for our sins and then he'll come back. But then he's leaving And what's called the Holy Spirit will come and dwell in. I mean, so you can just imagine them going, I've given up like the beauty of this temple and permanency, the massiveness. And you know what Jesus said in verse 3 of Matthew 24? They came to him and they're asking him all these questions about the temple. And he said, there's not one single stone that you're enamored with that's going to be left. It's going to be wiped clean. It's going to be deserted and destroyed. In verse 3, then they asked this question, right? After Jesus told them, do you not see all these things? I promise you, this is what's going to happen. It'll be destroyed. Verse 3, Jesus, what is the sign of your coming? And what is the sign of the end of the age? Now, by the way, if you're keeping score at home, please make a note. The temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. And there's not been a temple there in 2,000 years. So when Jesus tells you something, you can take it to the bank. Notice what happened. What will be, and by the way, is that not the question of the ages? Have you ever asked yourself as we watch the news, whatever channel you watch the news on, have you not said either out loud or to yourself, man, what's coming next? What else could happen? What else is going to fall apart? What other wheels are going to come off? Whatever fire is going to be started in our country? And so we're asking the same question. What is the sign of his coming and of the end of the age? So let's not be enamored by man's knowledge or be enamored by some of the nice things we now have. I just want to remind you, the one who holds tomorrow in his hands longs for you to be held in his hands. Now notice, what are the, how do you answer the question, what's next? What's the sign of your coming, the end of the age? Well, look, if you would, in verse 5. Sorry, verse 4. Watch out that no one deceives you. Ladies and gentlemen, be careful that no one deceives you. Literally, it means don't be misguided. Don't let somebody come along, whisper in your ear. Don't let a certain crowd have undue influence on you and lead you astray. 
That word, don't be deceived, is a pregnant term to quote. I, I did go to class a couple times in Greek. And I, it means simply a word that's got several great insights in one word. So don't be misled. Don't let anybody get in your head and, and lead you astray. Don't let anybody, literally, here's what it means, don't let anybody discourage you. Don't let anybody deceive you. And don't let anybody distract you. And ladies and gentlemen, there's a hundred, I'm A-D-D-D-D-D, to be Captain Obvious, number one. I mean, I found that out as a college student. And the professor said, uh-huh. And uh, then they found out I was dyslexic. And that was back in the day when hardly anyone knew about what dyslexia was. And so I, I just want you to understand it's easy in this day and age to get distracted and to be deceived and to be led astray. So notice what he says. Watch out. Many are going to come in my name, verse 5, and deceive many. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. We have potentially right now seven areas of the world that could burst into flames in a day. Not to mention what's going on in the Ukraine, and not to mention some forces that are going on when it comes to terrorism. You're going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. And notice verse 7, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. I used to think that's talking about like countries in the Middle East, like the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, or the kingdom in Saudi Arabia. But that word also has a little more meaning than that. Those are kingdoms. That's how they're categorized. Uh, we would call them a nation, but that's a, a phrase they use, and they have a right to use. But you know what? It also is talking about how even one group in one place, one country, if you'll let me use that term, will all of a sudden, it'll be like there's two kingdoms. And we'll be divided and when we get divided, that's when, as Sherlock Holmes says, the game is afoot. So verse 7, nation's going to rise against nation. Now, I want you to understand, then it goes on to say, look at verse 10. Make sure that you don't take offense at what people tell you. Many are going to betray one another. Many will hate one another. They'll be brother against brother. Families will be destroyed. That's all in that phrase, what it means in the original. Lawlessness will increase. How many times have we planned on going somewhere, and your wife has said, or men, we've said, I don't feel comfortable taking you to that area. I don't feel comfortable taking you to that city. And it may be a place that you've always gone and always loved. But today, the lawlessness in our country, the love of many will grow cold. But Jesus says, but the end is not yet. All these things must happen, but they're the beginning of the birth pangs. Verse 8, the beginning of the birth pangs. How do you know when the babies do? When all of a sudden you've got to go? I remember we were uh, with child. I was a seminary student, and we lived across the street from Brahms. And while my wife was pregnant, there were many times I had to go across a road. There wasn't a light or a lane. I mean, it was in the middle, about six lanes of traffic. And several times a day, put my life in harm's way because of the, I mean, how do you know when it's time for the baby, when it's trip number five in one day? I, maybe that's a sign. But literally, that word means the birth pains, the labor pains. Ladies, no one has to tell you when it's time for the baby to come, the pains are not only more frequent, they're what? More intense. My wife said, honey, I think I need to go to the hospital. I said, honey, are you sure? I am sure. <laughs> My wife, Diane's watching. I'm sorry, honey. Uh, Pastor Jack wanted me to, to share that. But uh, <laughs> so I just want you to know, do you agree with me? Let's begin with the end in mind, labor pains. We're in the last days. And Jesus over and over again says, no one knows the day or hour. Don't be discouraged. So Jesus gave that message. He is, that's in a great discourse there in the Mount of Olives. 
And that was his last great discourse. Well, how in the world are you and I supposed to be able to live in the days that Jesus described 2,000 years ago? Well, I want, let's look quickly, turn to Matthew chapter 6. Let's look at his first discourse, because it's in the first discourse, what is called the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus is telling those in Matthew chapter 6, early at the beginning of his public ministry, he is giving them the secrets how to live through what he knows is coming the last days. And if I may say, without trying to be melodramatic, I believe we're in the bottom of the ninth inning. I believe we're in the fourth quarter. I believe we could be approaching the 17th hole. I believe with several moments till midnight. I believe the final curtain could fall. I believe the sand is running out of the hourglass. Whatever term you connect with, I believe with all my heart that we've got to help our students and we've got to remind ourselves that good leaders begin with the end in mind. We know there's some difficult, perilous days ahead. So what did Jesus say to prepare them? That I started with the end in mind, begin with the end in mind, but now I want to show you the answer for how to be ready, how to have our families ready, and how personal this God is. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus takes them up on the side of this mountain, and he begins to teach and to preach. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. In verse 1, he says, be careful, don't practice your righteousness in front of people in order to be seen by others, verse 1. Don't don't be one of those that whenever you do something righteous, you want everyone to see it, you wait till you're in public, and you want some kind of applause or attention for it. Do you know the Bible says there's only three ways that we can truly do righteous acts? Three acts that Jesus called righteous. All of them are in this chapter. The first one, don't give your alms to the poor and make a show of it. You and I must be involved in helping those that need help. Trust me, I was a kid growing up in that kind of home. I know about being passed around from this place to that place like a pack of cigarettes. I know what it's like to chase a dad down the street. I grew up, I had no father, I had no family, and until I was 17, I had no future until that night when I heard about Jesus. And I want you to know We need to do our part in helping those who need help. And it's your neighbor. And there's nothing talked about what color somebody is or where they're from or uh, what language their native language is or what their politics. No, no. The word neighbor means near one. Those you come in contact with. Our job is to use what we have to try to help others. In the Bible, Jesus valued the giving of alms to the poor, but he said, don't make a show of it. Don't draw attention to it. You need to do it in private. Number two is prayer. Look what he says. When you pray, verse 5, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogue or on the street corners to be seen. I tell you, they're going to get their reward. But if you pray, go to your private room, shut the door, pray to your father who's in secret, And your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then in verse 16, the third act of righteousness is fasting. Don't be like the, don't be sad faced like the hypocrites, which means play actors. They make their faces unattractive so that their fast is obvious to all. If you do that for other people and say, oh, I've been on this fast, or oh, you can't believe what I'm going, whenever we do that, Jesus says, whatever reward you're going to get, that's your reward. So if you want to do righteous things so that when the yogurt hits the fan, when the guacamole is in the blender, and one of my favorite dishes, I asked the restaurant some years ago, how'd they make it? And they put these ingredients, they put it in the blender. And I said, man, that that blender reminds me of the first part of my life, (laughs) you know just chopped into pieces and going around and around in circles. Well, that's what's happening in these last days. You want to do something righteous? Well, let's learn about how do you pray, and we close with this, 
It's called the Lord's Prayer. Verse 9, Jesus said, pray. He doesn't say if you can or if you have time. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father, who's in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do not bring, do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, ladies and gentlemen, simply, and I'm ashamed to say this, I've been around the things of God, but notice that phrase in the prayer of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, it's not my Father in heaven. It's what? Say it. Our Father in heaven. Give me today my daily bread. No. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts. Now, we're pretty good at trying to pray and, you know, confess, Lord, I could have done that better. I wish I hadn't done that. Lord, forgive me. But, you know, we're in this together, folks. And if the body of Christ would ever treat each other in the body the way we should, we wouldn't be able to have enough room to house the folks. And if the body of Christ treated our neighbors the way the Bible says, we wouldn't have room for all those together. But I'm I'm ashamed to tell you, I've only seen just recently, I've prayed that prayer hundreds of times, right? Haven't you? But give us, forgive us, deliver us. And I want you to know that if we'll forgive people who've wronged us, Jesus said in his own words, we'll be forgiven much. So ladies and gentlemen, number one, begin with the end in mind. Number two... Number two, do first things first. And we've talked about some righteous things. We've talked about some things we need to get in order. We need to get right with God. And last of all, how can you be present at the future? Well, I tell you this. I told you a little bit about my background. I grew up on these ocean, on the ocean, on these commercial boats, hours and days and weeks and sometimes months. You'd go in and take your catch back so it could get ice down and get, you know, but literally being gone from my home for long periods of time on these boats. And I became very curious about how things worked. Two things in particular. Number one, the heavens. I know when late at night, when the stars are bright, deep in the heart, I know the song. But if you're on the ocean, a hundred miles off the coast in any direction, those stars look like you can reach up and touch them. I became fascinated by the universe, and I began to wonder, is there a God? How did that happen? Where did that come from? And then I watched all this stuff brought up out of the ocean. And do you realize there's like 150,000 species that many people think have not even been named yet, found? I mean, the ocean is so vast, we've only discovered and know really about 12 or 15 percent of all the oceans. So I want you to know, I, was fa- I knew there had to be more to life than the drugs and the fighting, and I watched these men and what they did when they got off, uh, on, off, you know, off the boat and at shore, and their families were back in this town, and what they'd do while they were gone, and I, I saw that's what I thought it was to be a man, talk that way, fight that way, use that language, go do this, take just, it's all about you, and then that, so I, I began to wonder, is this how men are supposed to live? Because I I didn't have anyone stick around. I didn't have a father figure. And so I simply say this to you. I became curious about a third thing, not just the ocean, not just the universe. How do you navigate? How do you know where the, the fish will be? How do you make sure the boat's sturdy? Because hurricanes would come, storms would come. How do you know how to get back home? How do you, do you have a port to get to? And then why are men so miserable? And again, this is me as a kid, right? Why are, and th- that's not all men, but it was a segment of men. It was all I knew. And so I began curious. And the night I gave my life to Jesus, 
I found the answer. All those things happen because there's a creator, the ocean and the stars. But then I found out how men and women should be. That a Savior who died on the cross, shed his blood, paid for things that we've forgotten about, paid for things we hope no one will ever know about, paid for all of our sin, agonizingly paid, shed his blood, was buried and rose again. And that same Jesus is coming back again. And so I close, you want to be present at the future? And we know we're in difficult days, and I think we all agree, no one knows the day or hour or the year, but we know, I think we know we're getting in the neighborhood. Things are looking a little familiar, right? You ever, you're, well, this looks familiar. I mean, that's kind of what I see when I watch what all's going on around the world in our country. So simply put, can I tell you in one word what you must do to be present at the future? And that means have the blessings of God and the presence of God and the provisions of God, no matter what comes unraveled or what all goes on in our world. And it's one phrase, I'm going to ask you to write it down, please. And I know some of us aren't in the habit of doing that, and, but please remember this. Do today. Teenagers, look at me. You got a lot of things distracting you in your mind and heart. The world's doing everything it can to tug at you. You're getting a lot of encouragement here about the things of the Lord. But I want to give you a challenge that I promise you, and I've lived now, I know I look 35. Thank you for that. And then for some of you, same to you, buddy. But uh, anyway, but I, I want you to know for 50 years, for 50 years, I look back on a moment where I did one night, what I will be grateful for for all eternity. I gave my heart and my life to Jesus. Amen. And I look at the life I've had, there's no way I could have the life I had from where I came from except one thing. If I give my heart and my life to Him, He will come, save, change, cleanse, and forgive. Right. So I'm asking you, yes, things are going to be dark and are getting dark. Yes, there is a personal God who wants to be your father, who loves you, who knows you, who has acts. He'll stop no matter how busy he is, like a good father, for that child, you. And if you come to him, he says, I'll in no wise cast you out. I'd like the privilege to pray for you. I'd like the privilege, try to encourage you. But here's my great prayer for you. Do today. Some of us are out of church. We're out of God's will. Some of us have some things going on in our life that you know and God is telling you is going to trip you bad. And then what about eternity? What about life and death? Because none of us know even how long we have, much less the earth has. How can you know that you know that you know? Do today in this room, this place, what you'll be forever grateful you've done. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being in this pulpit. Thank you for the privilege of hearing praise and worship. Thank you for the joy of seeing many friends and being reunited and reacquainted. But Lord, most of all, thank you for the privilege to be able to share the good news of Jesus. Lord, that if you be for us, who in the world could ever be against us? And Lord, you've been with me, what you've done in my life, and my family's life. And Lord, what so many in this room have experienced. But yet, there are men and women and teenagers and college students and singles and children and this, all, all backgrounds. And Lord, you brought us today. And I pray, Lord, through the power of your Spirit, for that man, that woman, that young person, who'd be willing to say, I want to do today what I will be grateful for all eternity that I've done. I want to call upon the name of the Lord. I want to ask the Lord to cleanse me and to forgive me. I'm going to ask this personal God to be my uh, heavenly Father. And I pray, Lord Jesus, this would be the greatest days in many lives. 
So for those who need to get right with you, for those of you who say, I want to be found faithful in serving the Lord in, in a church that's trying to make a difference in the world, most of all, I want to know that I know that I know that I know that if I died tonight, I have eternal life. We pray in Jesus' name. Now, every head is bowed. I'm going to ask one quick question. How many of you can say, Jay, I know that I know if I died tonight, I believe I would go to heaven. I've called upon the Lord. I've invited him into my life, and his spirit bears witness with my spirit. If that's true, no one's going to point at you. No one's looking. Heads are bowed, but I'm looking. Would you just slip your hand up high and say, I've, done, I've prayed that prayer. You were right. I'm going to be grateful for all eternity for what I did upstairs. God bless you. Look at all these young people and so many all over this room. God bless you. Thank you. With every head bowed, every eye closed, how many would say, Jay, I need to do today what I'll be grateful for all eternity that I have done. I need to humble myself and give my life to Jesus Christ. I need to accept his forgiveness, his love, what he did on the cross and then coming back to life. I want eternal life. Jay, would you pray for me? I believe you, you're not gonna point at me or embarrass me, but would you pray for me that I would give my heart and my life to Jesus before it's everlastingly too late? And I'm asking you, please pray that I'll not be ashamed of Jesus, the one who did so much for me and longs to become a part personally in my life. With every head bowed, every eye closed, again, I promise no one will point at your embarrassment. But with every head bowed, how many would just simply say, Jay, pray for me. I need to do today what I'll be grateful for all eternity I've done. I need to give my heart and life to Jesus. I want God to shut hell open heaven. If that's your prayer, would you slip your hand up high? Right where you are, all over this room. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Up in the balcony, yes. God bless you. Young people, I need Jesus. I'm not ashamed of Jesus. And then I wonder how many would say, Jay, pray for me. When you pray for those who need you, pray for me. I need to get right with God. I need someone to pray with me. I want to be a part of this church. I want to follow the Lord unashamedly and live out my life in obedience. If God's speaking to you about that and it's been on your heart probably for a while, would you just slip your hand up high so I can pray for you that I would come and get right with God and come back to Him. Let's stand quietly and reverently right where we are. Heavenly Father, have your will and your way. And I pray we would come in Jesus' name. If you're in the balcony and you want to give your heart and life to Christ, you want to get plugged in to a church and a Bible study, or there's something in your life you need prayer for, there are uh, encouragers, ministers in the balcony for you. And they're standing here in the front for those of us here. And I'm going to ask, even in the middle of an aisle, if God spoke to you, I know it's not easy. I did it that night in a room full of my peers. But I stood and gave my heart and life. My life's never been the same. If God spoke to you, I'm going to ask you to come right now, unashamedly, in Jesus' name. The best I know how. How about it, young man, young lady? My hope is found here on Amen. What a beautiful sight. Amen. Come on, my friend. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. As we rejoice with these, you know, I love this church for many reasons, but what, I mean, they made the aisles so you could drive a truck down the aisle. And if you notice, it's in an angle, so if you're even thinking about coming, I love that. And I'm being a little facetious, but I just want you to know, everything that goes on here is people that have been forgiven much, changed a lot, given a new start, and have grace that they don't deserve. And with all our hearts, we want you to have what he did for us. So there's plenty of people already in the church. It's a pretty good-sized place, right? We're not on a membership drive here. We're about you. You might be the only one left, but if God spoke to you, I'm going to ask you. We're going to sing one more verse. We'll wait for you. If you're in the balcony, again, the ministers are there for you to make it convenient. But don't be ashamed. Do today what you'll be grateful forever you've done. Come and join these that have come. Our last verse right now. You come. Amen. Well, I'm going to say this to the praise team. If I had a bus, you're coming with me, all right? But I, listen, thank you for letting me be back. Praise God. Dr. Mike. Yes, sir. Thank you, Jay Strack. Incredible message. And those that have made decisions, we want to encourage you to just go to your uh, left, my right. And we do celebrate each and every one of these. What a great response this morning. Praise the Lord. Uh, just a couple of things uh, before we go. Uh, one is our Relationship Matters Conference is two weeks from today. Dr. Charles Lowry is going to be with us. And as you can uh, see, this is a one-night marriage conference. It's for I any age, including those that are engaged or even thinking about getting engaged. Dr. Lowry is it's hilarious. This is going to be a fun evening, but it's going to be a powerful evening. Uh, so I encourage you to register by going to prestonwood.org slash marriage, marriage conference and be a part of that. That's two weeks from today. And then also as we uh, depart this room uh, on Sunday mornings after the 11 o'clock service, we scrambled to get it back ready for our Prestonwood and Espanol 2 o'clock service. We now have over 2,000